follow me. I'm usually here Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. I cut out early, but I do a lot of house calls, site visits, diagnostics, things like that. So for those of you who don't know me, hello, nice to meet you. For those of you who do know me, good to see you again. Yeah, we're going to talk about secret gardens and screening and making a private space using things that we can grow in our garden. We all know that adding plants to your landscape increases property values, and it's great therapy. I love spending time in my garden. It's just, it's just good to get in touch with nature. It feels good, it looks good, and I love it. Occasionally, I'll have a little problem here and there where it might not look as good as it could, but fortunately, I'm armed with quite a bit of resources, so I know how to fix most problems. But today, you guys are obviously here because you want a little privacy in your yard, or at least you want to know how to create it if you're looking to do that project in the future. So I've got a few options up here. The whole idea behind this is, now you see me, now you don't. <laughs> you can visually screen things out with plants, but plants also create a little bit of a barrier where they block sound as well. So if you're near a road and you have a lot of noise, or you have neighbors that like to stay up later than you do and make music, how about that? You can block some of that out visually with plants, but it also helps buffer the sounds. And sometimes if we want to buffer sound, we can actually add other elements like water features. So if you're looking to increase your privacy and decrease your sound, plants are gonna be a good buffer as well as bringing in some water to distract you from those other noises. Water's good to have in the landscape because it draws in more life. Hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, and even though some of you may not like them, but snakes. Snakes are good assets to have in your yard, as well as frogs and toads. So when we create a nice habitat for ourselves, we're also creating a nice habitat for those other things that come in. Some of us have yards that are a little more lush, and some of us have yards that are a little more what I call xeric, or water-wise. So I have a few examples of what you can do to create a little private area and make your yard more yours and less everybody else's. So I'm gonna start out with the main thing we think of when we think of screening. We think of trellises and arbors with vines growing on them. It's probably one of the easiest ways to construct a quick fence. They're usually fairly low cost, and they're usually pretty fast growing. Honeysuckle is one of my absolute favorites, and I've got a honeysuckle somewhere around here with flowers on him. Here's one. There are certain types of honeysuckle that you want to bring into your yard because of the flowers are very fragrant and fast growing, and there's certain honeysuckles that here in Prescott stay evergreen. If you're looking for an evergreen honeysuckle, Halls. It's called Halls Japanese Honeysuckle. Fast growing, low water, and evergreen. I love the smell on it. Mine blooms in the spring and it's in bloom again now that we've had some extra rain, but super fast growing. One Halls Honeysuckle, if you start it with a one gallon plant and you plant it on a trellis like this, in one year it would cover the whole thing. Not a problem at all. You can buy them in larger plants to give yourself a head start, or you can start with the smaller ones and stay within a smaller budget. Either way, you'll have a great screen that smells good. Question? The first you said it's a word that I think we get on and then Japanese, and I didn't get your first word. Japanese honeysuckle? Was there a word before that? Halls. H-A-L-L apostrophe S. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. So Halls Japanese honeysuckle is going to be probably my number one pick for fast growing and low water and still attractive. Some people like silver lace vine, which is equally as fast growing, if not faster than the honeysuckle. However, I don't find it as cosmetic appearing. It's kind of weedy looking. It gets a fluffier flower, kind of reminds you of a Queen Anne's lace almost in the, in the way the flower kind of spreads out, but very fast. The problem with silver lace vine is it's not always evergreen. If you live in a warmer spot, you may still have leaves on it, but if you're in a cold area, it's gonna go dormant. So if we're looking for a privacy screen and we use our yard all four seasons, you wanna lean more towards your evergreens. 
So Hull's Honeysuckle is an evergreen vine. We also have a great climber in a Banks Rose, a Lady Banks Rose. That is evergreen here. And it does bloom very profusely once a year. Lady Banks comes in white, comes in yellow. I don't think I've ever seen it in any other color, but I bet you they're working on it. Lady Banks Rose, fast growing. Has any of you heard of the Tombstone Rose? The Tombstone Rose is the largest rose ever, period, the end. It covers an area bigger than this greenhouse. That is a Banks Rose. So if you want something that's gonna eventually get big, cover a nice area, does well here and stays evergreen, a Banks Rose is a great plant for you. However, don't expect it to have roses on it all the time. It'll only do it in the spring. A nice evergreen, kind of keep your neighbors out type of plant would be your pyracantha. How many of you seen those red berries with the little pokey thorns and got scratched by them? I've got battle wounds from pyracantha. It's a great plant. I'm gonna walk this way and show them to you. I'm grabbing him by his supports rather than by the plant because I don't want to get bitten. Much woodier plant doesn't need quite the support that you need for an actual vine because it is rigid. If you can just give it a little bit of support, it'll start to grow upright and fill out. And as it matures, it gets coarser and it can actually support itself. Where honeysuckle, silver lace vine, Clematis, any of those other vines, they actually need some kind of support to hold them up, like a trellis. I've even seen people use a wire, like a clothesline. If you put a clothesline with a gap of 18 inches between, it's just enough for the plant to wrap itself around and then grow up to the next layer and wrap itself around. Pyracantha wouldn't need that. It just needs a little bit of support till it gets old enough to hold its own. But be careful, very thorny. Pyracanth is also called fire thorn. They don't call it that for no reason at all. It will bite you. So it's great along a property line if you got a nuisance that's coming back and forth. They don't want to go through this too often. Very low water use, evergreen, beautiful red berries in the fall. Nice plant if you don't mind a little scratches here and there. We've kind of touched on different vines and things like that that would work. I've got a smaller, uh, a smaller pyracantha over here. The difference in age between this plant and that plant is probably just a few years. So they're relatively inexpensive, pretty fast growing and tough. This is a great plant I think of in the winter time because it still has its foliage and it has red berries. Kind of makes you think of the holidays. If scented flowers are more your thing, you want to lean more towards your honeysuckles and your jasmines because they are going to give you a nice fragrance. Are the honeysuckles your thing? Yes. Most critters won't eat honeysuckle. I actually have honeysuckle growing on a fence near a horse pen and the horses aren't messing with it. They eat every other little speck of green around, but they don't touch the honeysuckle. The rabbits don't seem to eat it. I don't have a lot of deer in my neighborhood but I would imagine they're not gonna mess with it very much. I've used it in a lot of local landscapes and nobody's messing with it. Yes, sir. You were talking about how big the Banks Rose gets. Yes. Can you plant that on a rock wall? You can plant, Banks Rose needs some kind of support because like any other rose, it doesn't really have any tendrils that wrap. It just has really long canes. So as the canes get longer, they'll get more rigid and they'll be able to support themselves but when they're immature, they're green and soft. So the weight of the plant will, will make it fall down. But if you have it on a slope, it'll kind of climb up the slope. Any other questions before we move on to the next topic? Okay, so we've kind of talked about vines. Some vines are gonna be better in hot sun areas where we have a lot of exposure, a little bit drier conditions. That's where your silver lace, your honeysuckle, your pyracantha, those all come in. If you have a spot that's a little more protected, not as much sun, but you still need some privacy, then you might try Virginia creeper. I've got some down here. That's the one that turns scarlet in the fall. You've heard the expression red wall. That is a red wall. And then next to it, I've got ivy. There's different types of ivy, Boston ivy, English ivy, needlepoint ivy. Pick your texture. 
Most of them will stay evergreen. However, I think it's the Boston that turns red and goes dormant. So if you don't mind letting a little extra light in in the winter time to warm things up, but you want that privacy in the summer months while you're hanging out barbecuing, then you might try an ivy. How tall do those get? Vines are kind of going to grow indeterminately. They're just going to keep going. I've seen honeysuckle spread about 12 feet. I imagine it would probably grow longer if you let it. Ivy, I've seen cover the whole side of a 40 foot building. So it'll just keep going. Pyrocanth, I figure probably tops out at about 12 feet. Honeysuckle about 12 feet. Silver lace vine, maybe more like 20 to 25. But vines will cover basically any direction you, you let them go. So if you have a big pallet you want to cover with something, a vine is going to be very fast and very efficient and very easy. If you don't want to deal with the vines, if, if to you a vine just doesn't do, doesn't do it, doesn't make you happy, then you can go with trees and shrubs. Or a little bit off the main path would be grasses. So we get some really large grasses. Pampas grass is one of those great big ones that gets those the big plumes that look like they belong on a circus horse. You know, the feather on their head. Well, that would be the pampas grass. And I have some pampas grass over here on a cart in pots. If you put it in a pot, it's gonna stay a little more contained and it's mobile. You can move it where you need it to go. And I'm waiting for the camera to pan to the side so that we can show you the pampas grass. And I think the camera's working on it. Here we go. You can see over here mm -hmm. that we have two pampas grass in pots. Um, you might not be able to see. Let me scoot him over a little bit for you guys over here on this side. We have two pampas grass in pots. Pretty dense. These are five gallon plants. This plant is called a dwarf. Even though it's called a dwarf, it can still get to be about eight feet tall. Well, imagine eight feet tall and about six to eight feet wide, and you've got a pretty good screen in one plant. No support needed, just a big empty spot in your yard. Now you see me. Now you don't. All right, so we talked about these grasses. There are other grasses that you can use that might not get quite as large. So if you only need to screen a smaller area, you don't want to deal with something quite as cumbersome or, or huge as a pampas grass, then you might try the mooley grass or you might try the forester grass. They're all gonna stay a little bit shorter, more like people size. I've seen mooley grass anywhere up to about five feet, and I've seen forester grass up to about four to five feet. They're still gonna get their little plumes on them. It creates a nice little barrier. It's a nice natural barrier. It's a soft, when the wind blows, it kind of sways. Grasses are really, really got a lot of eye appeal and they're very low maintenance. If you don't want to go grass, you want to go more oriental, you want to have a, a, a more private Chinese Zen type garden, then you can go with actual bamboo. I've got bamboo here on the end. Most of your bamboos, your traditional bamboos, not heavenly bamboo, that's a different species altogether. Most of these are a little bit invasive but they make a great wall. So if you wanted to plant these and you don't want them to take over the space, I suggest putting a trough or a container and either setting the plants in those containers at the ground and on top or burying the container in the ground and planting inside that underground container. It'll keep these guys under control. They make a great screen, softening the edges without looking like an actual fence. You've got a little bit of privacy and a rapid growing, low maintenance plant. Bamboo. When I put a screen in at my yard, I want the backside to be a pretty much a tall wall. But I don't want to look at necessarily a green wall. I like to see layers and I think of nature. When you look out, you see the mountain peaks in the back, then you see the foothills in the front, and then you see the valley down below. So I try to follow that same concept in my yard. I put my tallest stuff in the back. So I create my wall. And then I put my medium-sized plants just in front of it. So right here we have some Botinia with barberry in front of it. The barberry is going to be a little bit lower, but it's going to give you that depth. 
so that we don't have just a green wall, but we have this layered effect. And then in front of the barberry, you could put some smaller accents that gives you not just a green wall, but all of a sudden an artistic creation. It's a lot more enjoyable to look at, and it gives you a little variation in your yard. It just, it just looks pretty rather than just a green fence. So we talked about grasses and bamboos, and we've talked about some vines, and now the standard traditional trees and shrubs. Most people think of screening plants as either a fence or a tree and a shrub. So we can start with big tall trees. You can put junipers next to each other, the big size like um, Wichita blue. And if you don't want to do just a straight wall of blue trees, you can break it up with a Spartan on either side. So if you look over here, you can see I actually have created that field. We have a Spartan. A Wichita Blue. And another Spartan. So instead of having all the same height, again, we broke it up to make it look a little more artistic and a little more visually appealing by putting a larger plant in the center of a contrasting color with two smaller plants on either side. They're gonna have about the same needs. They're, they're all junipers. They are gonna eventually top out at about the same size, but because we started with a larger one, he's always gonna have that head start. You can always put the taller guys on the end and the lower guy in the middle, or you can put the tall guy in the middle with the low guys. It's really up to you what you like. That's where you start making your yard more personal, more yours. Junipers don't need a lot of water. They are evergreen, but they do need sun and they need air. They need airflow. If you're sticking them in a corner where there's not a lot of sunlight and there's not a lot of airflow, they're going to get a little bit moist. If a juniper gets moist, they tend to get a hollow look. So if you were to look at a tree and look like it didn't have a lot of foliage on the inside, the first thing I would investigate is, what does that soil feel like? Stick your finger in there. Does it feel wet or does it feel dry? If you were to see a juniper in its native environment growing out in the middle of the desert, it's going to be very arid and that soil is going to dry out in between. And those trees can tolerate that. They actually prefer that. You can add moisture to the soil pretty regularly if it drains well, but if it doesn't drain well, the long-term health of this plant is not going to be as good. You're not gonna have the optimal conditions unless you let it dry out in between. Now, new plantings do need more water than established plants. So we're, lost, we're looking at maybe the first year or two, supplementing the water pretty regularly. And after the second year, we're gonna back off significantly and by the fourth or fifth year, we're only be watering during periods of extreme heat or drought. So if you're a water wise planter, or you get a water bill that makes you cringe, then you might consider the things that need less water, like your junipers, or I'm gonna show another one. It's a deciduous plant called buckthorn. Buckthorn is a great native, however, it is deciduous, but it's a perfect height to make a nice screen. It's a very natural plant. I think it's kind of underrated because it's not the most attractive plant, but boy, is this a tough plant. It will get a little flower, but mostly it's just a, a tough shrub that'll grow and make a nice bank. So if you want something a little different than what the neighbor has, and you want something that's going to survive if you go on vacation, this is a tough plant for you. If you want even more water-wise, less water bill and you have a hot hot spot say you're down in dewey or mayor and you want to create a screen but you don't want to run the water this is a native it's called atroplex or four wing salt brush when i moved into my place seven years ago there was a few of these on our property and i just mow the weeds around them and let them grow and those things are about eight feet wide and probably five to six feet tall no water at all they get what god gives them so you can put your atroplex, so I, if you want them to be pretty dense, I'd space them about five feet apart. If you need a little break in between, you're gonna go eight feet or more. They will take over a spot nicely with no supplemental water once established. And if you wanna break up that look, this dry, deserty gray look, 
put a yucca in front of it. The yucca will break it up, yet it still doesn't need a lot of attention. It's gonna kind of do its own thing. So if you're more of a desert style, or if you're more lush, we've got a screen for you. So how many of you have Photinia in your yard? Almost everybody in Prescott has a Photinia somewhere. If you don't have one, your neighbor's probably got one. It's a pretty cool plant, it stays evergreen, but it's another one of those plants that needs to dry out in between. If it stays too wet, you're gonna get that hollow look and you're gonna get that white fuzz stuff and the yellow spot stuff. Does anybody know what that white fuzz and yellow spot is? I, did I hear fungus and mildew? Yes. Fungus and mildew is really common on the Photinias. So if you keep them healthy, keep them pruned where they can get some airflow, they're gonna be a happier plant and they're gonna reward you with growth. And what do we love about the red tip Photinia? Hint, hint, I just said it. <laughs> the red tips. So I paired the Photinia with the barberry just because the red and the new growth of the Photinia and the red and the barberry really bring each other's colors out. It just makes a nice palette. Some people don't like the contrast, but I love contrast. Lime green and purple, that's great. Green on a Photinia with the contrasting red and the barberry, to me that's just really artistic. Nature has such good palette to work with and so many things that will survive here in Prescott. So we've talked about grasses and vines and some trees and some shrubs and even some deserty stuff. We also have this other option where some people have just put in a gate. Sometimes you just build a fence with a gate on it. The gate says, okay, I'm defining this area, but we can open the gate and we can leave it open that creates a new room, or we can leave the gate closed which creates a barrier. But sometimes you just don't want to look at that hard fence. So on that hard fence, you can hang art, you can let vines grow, or you can soften it with, with shrubs and trees. You can start with anything as small as a grass, or a salvia and let them spread in the front to soften it and put backdrop plants behind it. The whole key is, is to create that defining edge. And a defining edge could be as simple as a single plant or it could be a layered section. Once we have these plants installed and they look beautiful, how do we maintain them? How do we keep them pretty? I've mentioned a lot about getting airflow. And if we do these layered looks of plants, sometimes the guys in the back just don't get enough air or enough light. Or sometimes the guys in the front grow bigger and block the guy you wanted to see in the back. So what can we do to keep these things looking healthy for a long time? First of all, we wanna make sure that we plant them correctly. So many times people will plant a plant and it does really well for about two years and then all of a sudden the plant fails. Well, what could possibly be the cause of that? First of all, did the plant settle? Was it planted a little low in the ground and as the, as the material around it decomposed, did that plant sink? And is all the water pooling at the center of that plant? Well, center, center moisture on a juniper is definitely a, a cause of, of stress. Where center moisture on a barberry, maybe not so much. Center moisture on a grass will cause that grass to get denser and then eventually it'll rot in the center. So sometimes we do have to do some maintenance. Pruning, snipping out any of those diseased or damaged pieces. Sometimes it's just a matter of cosmetically taking away the old mulch and putting in fresh clean. And sometimes it's a matter of actually assessing where that plant sits in the ground. We all know about feeding. How often are you feeding your yard? If you're using this Waters product right here, the 744, the all-purpose, that's designed to be used four times a year. Why four times a year? I know that I can go out and find stuff that you only put in, hammer in the ground, and you do that once a year. Well, the reason why this one needs to be fed more often is because of the type of, of source that those nutrients come from. So I like to feed things that are naturally sourced. So if it comes from a natural part, it's going to break down to an, a, a piece that's smaller and easier for your plant to use. So what's more natural than chicken manure and cottonseed meal? Not a whole lot unless you're making your own compost. So that's going to degrade into pieces that your plant can suck up easily. Where those little hammer-in stakes, they might be effective for a little while. 
but they're made in a lab and they're composed primarily of different types of salts. Well, we have a lot of minerals in our soil anyways. So if you're handling in salt into your ground and our hard water binds to that and adds deposits everywhere, can that tree pick it up? How many of you looked at your shower head and noticed the, the hard water deposits on your shower head? That's how many minerals we have just running through our water. That's not even counting what's sitting in the dirt. So if we want to keep these plants looking happy and healthy longer, we need to feed them, but we need to feed them something that they can eat. It'd be like giving your kid, your newborn baby, a can of baby food or a jar of baby food, but not opening it. Here, I gave him food, but he couldn't take it. What's wrong? Well, you give your plant food, but sometimes they just can't take it. Sometimes it just doesn't break into a piece that they can use. And sometimes it's because we're giving them the wrong type of fertilizer. Sometimes we're giving them too much moisture. And sometimes our pH has gotten out of control. So when I look at a maple, you can use an Ammer maple, which is a multi-trunk maple, to make a great screen. And then you'll get this beautiful fall color. However, if your Ammer maple starts to look veiny, or it doesn't turn red anymore, it just turns kind of a funky yellow color, you should be looking at food. When did I feed it last? Okay, well, I've been feeding it four times a year. She said to feed it Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day. I've been doing that. And then I get it again in the spring before it wakes up. So it can't possibly be food. Why has he got this problem? Well, how much water are you giving it? Well, I'm not watering it right now because the rains are coming, okay? So stick your finger in that soil and feel it. Well, that soil feels good. It doesn't feel too wet and it doesn't feel dry. Well, the last factor may be your soil pH. That's the last thing that I usually look at. And so if you're feeding regularly, you used your root and grow when you planted the plant, you've been using your, your all-purpose at regular intervals, sometimes you just need to add some sulfur. Sitting here in the desert, we have really high pH, alkaline soil. You've heard that, right? That means our soil's running, I would say, in most yards around here, anywhere from eight to eight and a half. Well, eight to eight and a half is pretty darn alkaline, and most plants don't like that. Atroplex doesn't care. A lot of your desert natives that you walk around and you see, they don't really care. But the ones that you'll really see it on are those things that we want to see beautiful fall color. Why do we have a maple in our yard? We want the pretty red. Why do we have a blue spruce? We want that blue. But it's just not looking like it did two years ago. That's where sulfur steps in. Sulfur is going to lower the pH. It's gonna make it more acidic and keep things happier and healthier. So we've got our screen planted. We've got a few accents on either end. We've been feeding, we've been watering, we've been keeping the pH in check, but we still have a problem with something that's not doing what it should. Say we have a big pampas grass, and it's just not as big or feathery as it was the year before. How long ago did you divide that plant? How long ago was it planted? So if you put a pampas grass in in 2010, and it hasn't done anything since, you've just been feeding it, watering it, and you notice this year, well, darn it, he's just not got as many feathers. I've been taking the same care every year. That plant has gotten too big. He needs to be divided. Just like irises and daylilies, your grasses need to be divided. After they get big enough, if you don't cut them and make them smaller, the old part, the center part, is going to start to decline and rot away, and it's gonna introduce new diseases to the otherwise healthy part of the plant. So do your regular maintenance, do your due diligence, and keep these plants happy. Now sometimes we have our screen, we have our healthy yard, but we still have a lot of noise factors that we've got to deal with. So to help with that noise factor, we mentioned bringing in water, running water. We didn't mention it, but we could also hang a wind chime. The chime will cause movement, it'll draw the eye to the chime, but it'll also make a nice, pleasant sound. Sometimes just the sound of a wind chime will diffuse passing traffic. Sometimes we want to bring birds in so we can hear the birds instead. So there are screening plants that are actually great bird plants. Anything that's going to produce a berry on it. Snowberry, junipers, anything that's going to have a little piece on it, sand cherries, they're all gonna have a little section that the birds can use not only for a hiding place, but they can also forage on it. 
a lot of your grasses are great for things to get into and burrow. So if you make your environment friendly for not just yourself, but for nature, you're gonna have more things that come in that make it a little more your personal space, your private garden. And we always want to have these other factors like birds and bees and butterflies in our garden. So we wanna make sure that we're using things that are friendly to them. So you, we're drawing all the features in. We've got our plants in, we're feeding them, we're taking care of them. We're starting to see birds and butterflies and bees come in, but darn it, I got grasshoppers. What can I do? I've got grasshoppers. Well, you can spray them and kill them, but guess what? Does that spray only kill grasshoppers? No. So you're spraying the grasshoppers. Who else are you gonna kill? The ladybugs. The other birds and bees that are gonna eat that are gonna ingest that toxin. So how many of those are gonna die? Well, the ones that are sensitive to that chemical. So if you wanna kill a specific bug, target the bug. Where are the grasshoppers? Are they eating your mint? Are they worms on your mulberry tree? Use the right product for the right bug or go with other means. So if you have a grasshopper problem, there is actually a parasite you can introduce called NOLO. NOLO is a parasite specific to grasshoppers and Mormon crickets, and it'll keep the defoliation down by controlling the grasshopper population. It takes a little while, but the grasshoppers eat it, it gets inside their gut, and they slow down and eventually die. The other grasshoppers eat the infected grasshopper, and then they become infected, and so the cycle begins. You're not gonna to totally eradicate the species, however you are gonna put a good dent in them. The problem is, is they're very mobile. So if you're using NOLO and you're keeping your yard bug free, and your yard is healthy and beautiful, tastes good, the guys from next door are gonna go, oh, I'm tired of this, let's go next door. I'm tired, of, I'm tired of eating Smith food. Let's come over here and eat Jones food. Their garden's gonna taste better, so they're gonna move in. So you're gonna to have to constantly remember, let the noise go by. You gotta to remember to, to change up your arsenal, be a little bit of, of diversity. We wanna plant plants of different species so that we don't have one outbreak on one plant. If we've got Photinia and one Photinia gets sick, eventually they're all gonna get sick. So if you mix that Photinia up with something a little bit different, you'll still have your screen. If you have your layered effect and the plant in the back loses its leaves, the plant in the middle has still got something going on if you chose an evergreen. So think about, make your plan and decide, what effect do I want? Do I want a solid screen year round? Do I want something to buffer me from the neighbors? Or do I want to fill in this space and make it green? Once you decide what you can, you want to do, then you can take your action. I would always recommend to, to plant diverse species so that you're mixing and matching. One trumpet vine might look beautiful in June and August, June, July, and August. But in winter, what is that trumpet vine going to look like? So if you want to maintain that screen, put something else in there with it so that when the trumpet vine is done flowering and the leaves start to fall off, you're not looking at this bare fence or this bare wall. Have something to back it up, unless you don't use the space. Maybe you're a, a snowbird and Prescott is your summer home and in winter you go down to Phoenix. Well, in the summertime, you want something green and lush, but in the wintertime, it doesn't matter. If that's the case, then trumpet vine would be perfect. Because if you're gone for months at a time, the trumpet vine is gonna be okay with less water. And if you're here in the summertime, you'll enjoy its beauty, and you won't care that it's nothing in the winter. But say you live here all year round, and say you cook every night on your barbecue. If you cook every night on your barbecue and you want that privacy screen, but you don't want something super large, put yourself some pots with dwarf Alberta spruce, or a pot of bamboo, and that'll give you a nice little wall that you can move as needed, but still give you your privacy. So I've covered a lot of different bases. I think I see a hand up back there. Yeah. Um, just to go back to the grasshoppers for a minute. Yes. Um, we were in TV for a few years up against the prairie, and we had an invasion, just thousands of them. And I had a vegetable garden, and they took it down to the dirt in about a day and a half. Just for one thing, which they walked around, they 
Yeah, you know, uh, there are some plants that are less appealing to bugs. Sage is one of those really high resin, smelly plants. So if it's got a strong fragrance and it's something that you can always test. I actually have mint planted in certain areas because I happen to know that the grasshoppers in my area like the mint. So I'll put the mint out and I'll have a big bed of it. It's probably, I don't know, six, eight feet wide, four feet deep. And it's just a lot of mint. I let it do its thing, spread, go crazy. But I watch the mint. When the mint starts to have lots of little baby grasshoppers hopping around, I know that there are grasshoppers in that mint and I will get out my spray and I will kill the plugs in that plant. I will only spray the mint though. I won't spray the stuff around it because I really only want to hit the plants that are infected with grasshoppers. Now when the grasshoppers are done eating that, they are going to migrate outward and they're going to eat something else. But if you can put a sacrificial plant out, that's what I do with my mint, it's tough, it'll come back. They can eat it to nothing. I know it'll be back. So I have that there purposely to know when it's time to treat for grasshoppers. Now if you're using Nolo Bay, I've got five acres, so that's a lot of Nolo. Um, I think one pound will do about an acre. If you have a heavy infestation, you might want to use two pounds. Well, five acres, that's like 10 pounds of NOLO. And at about $25 a pound, I don't want to spend that kind of money for grasshoppers. So I plant my sacrificial plants. When I see the, the nymphs, the little bitty baby grasshoppers, I know that they're really infested in there and I will kill them off by spraying with a permethrin or something. Yes, ma'am. Nolo, is it um, toxic to dogs? No. Nolo is in a bran, and it's a it's basically a little parasite that will only grow in the gut of a grasshopper or a Mormon cricket. I won't recommend having your dog eat it. However, I haven't heard of any dogs getting sick from eating it. Well, I have a puppy, and she eats everything. Yeah. <laughs> what you can do with that is, if you can find Nolo Bay, I don't know if we even have any left. We, yeah, we have a little bit left. It, it has a shelf life. So you want to make sure that you're buying as fresh of NOLO as you possibly can and that you apply it when and where the grasshoppers will get it. It is in a wheat bran base. So if you put NOLO bait out, whether you sprinkle it out and just let it fall where it does or you put stations out and we expect rain, what happens to bran when it gets wet? It turns to mush. Grasshoppers won't eat the mush. So spread it when it's dry or create a bait station where the NOLA bait can sit and not get wet. I'll use a big soup can, you know, one of those big ones that's like this tall, and I'll cut out both ends and then I'll stick a smaller can, like a tuna can, full of NOLA inside. So that it's hollow on both ends but in the middle. So I have a little tunnel with a feeding station inside. The grasshoppers can come in and eat and then they can go the way they want. It sets a little bit higher so it doesn't get wet. It's inside that that can so water doesn't land on top and it helps. However, like you mentioned, you're across from a big open field and the grasshoppers just migrate in and eat what's good. So I could treat with NOLO every time I could buy NOLO and still never kill them all. So I try to set my sacrificial plants, kill them when they're little, apply the NOLO along the edges of my property, hoping that I can infect those ones so that others come in and pick up that parasite. Yes, ma'am. I can't think of any ivies that would grow in full sun. Um, they will tolerate sun for a certain amount of time, but at this elevation, the light is so much more intense that you will notice the burning on them. Sometimes you can plant an ivy on an east side where it's getting sun. However, I would say west and south, I would skip the ivy altogether and go with honeysuckle. Another kind of vining plant that I didn't mention was vinca. Most of us have vinca growing underneath a pine tree or a juniper somewhere. Vinca is actually a really easy, vigorous plant. You can hang a pot of vinca up high and let it drape down like a hanging plant. You can do the same thing with ivy, and that'll give you a, a screening effect, but rather than from the ground up, like a stalagmite, we have a stalactite hanging from a pot. So that's another option to think. Think outside the box. You had a question? Yes. You talked about I missed the first 10 minutes, you may have covered it already, but when you're using a lot of potted plants, and some plants you're taking a pot and actually putting it in the ground Yes. as, as a control measure, do these plants, and when do they get root bound? If they're 
in a situation like that, for example, bamboo. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to kind of refer you to a house plant, just, just to show you because that's the most common potted plant that most people can relate to. So when we look at a house plant, we want lots of lush foliage and beautiful. But we also go out there and we dote on them. You know, we might water them every week or every couple of weeks. And we feed them every other time we water. So we really provide everything that plant needs so it doesn't have to develop a big root ball. Because a house plant's going to be a little bitty pot with a great big plant on top. So you're doing the same thing when you plant in the ground in a pot. I don't use a fancy pot. I use an old nursery container. As long as it's got drain holes, then it gives an escape for that excess water to go. And you put a bamboo and you plant it in the ground in a pot, it will control the spread of it. And eventually, if you're using a nursery container, it will burst that container. So if you notice it's starting to look like it's a little bit bigger than its base, then you better move it to a bigger pot or divide it, or else it's gonna start taking over because it has passed the barrier now. Does that make more sense to you? Yes, yeah, so do they do they die down or some well, on something as vigorous as a bamboo, probably not. On a grass, you might notice the center dying out. And then again, that, that means to divide it. A bamboo will kind of just burst its pot and just keep going because it's so strong. Um, I'm trying to think of another small thing that, like I plant mint in the ground in pots. That doesn't really burst the pot, but it'll go under and come up on another side. We have some plants that have flowers about this big in pots. Like a hibiscus? It's some kind of hibiscus we got. Yeah, and mosquitoes you know, or something. A, Does it go dormant in the winter yes. and stays kind of, I would say, lower and wider than it is tall? No, but the flower about this flower, big, yeah. yeah, I sound like a mosquitoes hibiscus. Those are probably planted in the ground with the intent to lift. The mosquitoes is hardy to like minus 20, minus 30 degrees, so you don't have to lift it. But if you have a different type of hibiscus that's not as winter hardy, the whole point of that pot was so they could lift the whole plant out and store it in the winter. We actually lift it out in our veranda outside. Oh, so it's not even in the ground? So not underground. Okay. Ground, no. What I was wondering is that those plants have filled, pretty well filled that pot in the last couple of years. They're still growing tall and everything, but will they stay that way or grow? If the plant goes dormant every year, it'll eventually grow, but it would be a long time. It would eventually want to grow in a larger container. The key to healthy plants is healthy roots. So if you sense that that root might be getting too dense, so when you water it, does the water go out the sides or does it have a hard time filling it? Then, go so it goes straight through, which tells me the roots haven't developed so fully that there's no room. If water will still drain through to the bottom, then it's not too root bound. And the fact that it dies back every year and starts all over again every year, that's basically, you're gaining a little bit of growth from year to year, but most of it's dying back and starting over again. How would you know if they got root bound? What do they look like? Do they? Well, the plant isn't gonna be as vigorous, number one. It won't look as happy. And number two, when you water it, it'll be more difficult to water because there's no place for the water to go. It'll either pour out the top or it'll, or it'll just not go anywhere. I mean, you'll just hold it on the plant and it just kind of runs off. That means that there's no room for water to go through. If there's no room for water to go through, then there's no room for air to go through. And roots need oxygen, they need water, they need minerals. And if the roots are so compacted that there's no room for that water to fall through, then it's time to divide, definitely. Well, and the root will, the, the plant will then <coughs> It'll just, it'll just decline. I wouldn't say it would all of a sudden die. It just won't look as good. It might not flower as much. It might not flower as big. It might not flower as long. And then you might notice the leaves are sparser and smaller. When you gauge the health of an aspen, we'll just use a quaking aspen for example because they're real easy. In the spring, the leaves come out and they're pretty good size. You know, I've seen aspen leaves that silver dollar up to maybe the diameter of a, a small orange. And then when it starts to get hot, the new leaves come out and they're smaller. They're more like dime to quarter size. And they start to get little, you know, dark green with kind of yellow tips and stuff like that. We water them to try to make them happy. But all of a sudden nature comes and the rains start happening. When the rains start happening, have you ever noticed how big the leaves on your aspen get? They get huge. We're talking like this big on an aspen. It's because he's getting a lot of resources. 
So when the resources are less, the leaves are smaller. When the resources are more abundant, the leaves are gonna be bigger. If the plant has still got big, healthy leaves, then it tells me that it's still happy, it's not stressed. If it became smaller leaves or stunted or discolored, then I would look at that might be a problem. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, on the Russian sage, how yes. also be a very invasive plant? Russian sage can be invasive. If you go with the dwarf variety, it's not gonna be as bad. But if you want a nice screen, you want the standard Russian sage. And I use the expression invasive only because it grows in a spot you don't want it. But if it's growing somewhere where you like it, then I would call that vigorous. <laughs> so it depends on what you're doing with it. If you want a nice big screen and you want to fill up a space, plant those vigorous plants. If you have a small yard, don't plant the invasives. Go with the dwarfs or the ones that are well behaved. You can cut Russian sage down pretty easy and it just will keep growing back and back. However, the sure way to hurt a Russian sage is to overwater it. So if you have a Russian sage and it's not performing the way you want, you're probably giving it too much moisture. Another question? Yes, ma'am. If I have a plant that is becoming root bound, can I take it out of the container, trim back the roots, and put it back in that same container? You can divide it or you can trim back the roots. So a lot of people will actually bonsai plants, you know, the Japanese art of bonsai, and you have these little miniature trees. How do they keep a maple this big? It's through pruning. So a plant is not gonna grow out of its container if you're maintaining it regularly. So if you start a small bonsai this big or maybe a house plant or maybe it's sitting next to your barbecue and it's full of herbs and it's starting to take over, you're gonna do some pruning, you're gonna pull it out, you're gonna cut back pieces inside or you're gonna divide it and then you're gonna set it back in what you want. That's how we control them. And it can be done. Some plants are gonna be easier than others. Some plants don't like to be messed with. However, if you're gonna do any repotting or any dividing, do it when it's gonna be less stressful on the plant. So if you're gonna divide daylilies or pampas grass, do it after the blooming has occurred, if it's going to bloom. Do it when the plant is dormant, so when it starts to turn brown in the fall or even in the winter time. Don't do it in the early spring unless you absolutely have to. If you have to divide in the spring, do it on a day that's cool or cloudy or do it in the shade because those roots aren't designed to have sun hit them. And here we're awful close to the sun and that sun is really intense. So you pull them out of the ground and it's like staring at the sun with your eyes and no glasses. It'll blind them or those roots will burn. Another question? Yes. I have an aloe plant that's in a size pot, but it's been in there for, I don't know, three, four years now, and it's like really huge now. <coughs> when, do I need to divide that and pull some of those out, or will it <coughs> contain itself? So on an aloe, you have a parent plant, right. and then you have pups that come yeah, off. Yeah, there's tons of pups. So I would take the pups, I would divide them and put them in their own pot, and keep the parent plant as live as you can. Um, aloe will sometimes bloom and then die. So use it. <laughs> use it and take advantage of those pups. That's why the plant does that. It, how many of you have a century plant in your yard? Century plant, they call them that because supposedly every century they bloom and then they die. Well, it's not really every century. It's however long the plant takes to do it. So it's going to set up a, a big stalk and then the parent plant is pretty much going to die back or start to decline. So the point of that stalk is to produce a flower, which produces a seed, which is basically reproducing. And that's all plants really want to do. They just want to reproduce, that's their life. A plant wants to grow, have a baby, and then do that. Some plants will continue and repeat. They'll keep flowering or they'll keep producing. And some plants only do it once. So on like an aloe or a century plant or any of those, once they do their reproduction through seed, that's pretty much the end. However, the roots will start to pop up with little pups so that the, they're not gonna totally die out. The species is not gonna be gone forever. It is still reproducing. So in your case, I would say pull the babies away, use the parent plant before it dies, or keep it until it flowers and then use it. Does they it get hurt, mushy though. Does it hurt to just pull them out? 
they're pretty tough. I mean, I would take it apart. Again, do it in a spot that's not necessarily full sun. Okay. Take it apart, break away as many of the roots. You know, more roots is better, but in the case of an aloe, they're pretty tough. They'll root on just about nothing. If it breaks off, like in the case of hens and chicks or a prickly pear pad, let it cure. Right. Let the open wound cure for about a day or two. You can even go as long as 10 days and then set it about halfway in some loose soil and it'll start to root. Yep. I would say that um, aloes are pretty resilient, any of those succulent type things, real fleshy. The fleshier the plant, the more resilient it's going to be to exposure on the roots. Good, good, good. Can I change the subject just for a minute? I think we've already changed the subject lots. Go ahead. On fruit trees. On fruit trees? No, yeah, like apple trees okay. and pear trees. Are there specific varieties that do well up here? Absolutely. So the first thing I would look at if you're looking for a fruit tree is I would look at the chill requirement. Actually, no, the first thing I would look at is what kind of fruit do I want? The next thing I would look at is what kind of chill requirement does that tree require? And when I say chill requirement, does anybody know what that means? How cold should it get? Oh, it's not so much how cold it gets, but it's how many hours of temperatures below 40 degrees. Okay, so chilling requirements are cumulative. So every time you have an hour below 40, that counts as plus one. And on some fruit trees, they want 200 chill, chill hours. Some of them want 800 chill hours. So looking at the chill requirement is pretty important so that you know when that tree is going to produce a blossom. Now, cumulative hours, like I said, they will be positive for temperatures below 40. They will be negative for temperatures above 60. So if we have a warm spell in January or February, that tree is going to actually take away some of its chill hours. It's either going to start to flower then if it's met its requirement, or it's going to have to back up however many hours we were above 60. So you want to make sure that you're finding the right ones for your spot. If you're in a colder area, and think, cold air sinks down. So I'm in Calden and I'm down low in the basin. So all that cold air in the morning will settle and it might be five degrees. When I get here to waters, it's already 20 degrees. So that variance isn't just because the sun came up and warmed, but it's also because I'm in a lower spot where the air is colder. So trees at my house are more prone to late frost. If you have late frosts, whether you're in Paulden or you're in Chino or you're in Williamson Valley, then you want to go with a longer chill requirement. And what that means is that tree isn't going to set blossom until it's hit 800 hours below 45 degrees or 40 degrees. That means instead of flowering in February when it warms up, it might not flower until March or April. So if we're flowering in March and April, it's less likely to freeze and damage that fruit than it would be if it's flowering in February. Does that make sense? Now, if it does start to blossom in March or April and it is going to get cold, what can we do to protect those blossoms? Well, if we would have planted the right variety, it wouldn't be in bloom in the first place. But if we did, if we absolutely had to have it, then we're going to plant that tree and we're going to watch it. What temperature does water freeze at? 32 degrees. So an ice cube is 32 degrees. It's 32 degrees on the outside of the ice cube. It's 32 degrees on the inside of that ice cube. So if you've got a fruit crop out there and you want to protect it, have you seen people water their yards when it's frozen and everything's got ice on it? It's 32 degrees. Damage occurs to fruit at 28. So that gives you your four degree protection so that you're less likely to use, lose that fruit. So there's your, there's your little sneaker. You can cover it, that'll give you about eight degrees. You can put old incandescent Christmas lights on it, or you can just plant the right varieties. Sometimes, you know, a Granny Smith is just too boring. We want something a little different. Grannies are great because they'll grow basically anywhere, but they have a long enough chill requirement that they grow well here where like apricots or nectarines not so much they don't want to be they're going to start blooming early in the year another way to think of it is what time of year are you harvesting your fruit an early crop like peaches and nectarines you're picking them and eating them in june july and august plums again they're kind of early
But when do you harvest apples? Later in the summer and in the fall. So your best fruit trees for this area are going to be your later, your apples. Not that you can't grow the others. You just have to be diligent about it. Do your homework. And sometimes it's a little bit of going out and actually muscling, covering a tree or something. Do you have any specific species of apples? Most of the ones that we carry here are pretty tough. Fuji's are real popular. Granny's are popular. Golden Delicious, Red Delicious. Honey Crisp is probably the most popular, but it's hard to find them because everybody buys them. But we try to carry varieties that are gonna to be tough for this area. Every once in a while we'll bring one in that actually likes more cold. So you may not see fruit on it with a mild winter, but most of them are gonna do well. The other thing about a fruit tree is check to see if it needs a pollinator. Some of them are self-fruiting, and it'll say self-fruiting on it, but something to remember, even if it says self-fruiting, they are always going to produce a better crop with a pollinator. Can you grow a wasp pear here? Can we grow a what? Wasp pear. Yes. And we do sometimes get those in. Right now, I don't think we have a whole lot in the means of, of pears but you can always take a look, see what we have. The Asians do well, Bartlett's, um, what's the other pair that does really well? Me? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I have um, apples and they're getting little holes or spots in them. Okay. I cut them and they're bad. Okay, so if you're having exit, exit holes, <laughs> that's what they are. They're exit holes. That um, bug was laid in there at the blossom phase. So when you were, got our trees full of bloom in March, April, whatever time that tree has got flowers on it, you want to hang an indicator trap on there, which is called a codling moth trap. And it's full of hormones, breeding hormones. So when the moths come into town and it's time for them to start breeding, they're going to go to the hormones. So if you have this trap full of hormones in there, you know when they're breeding. Well, when they breed, they lay their eggs inside the blossom. And as the fruit forms, it forms around the little insect egg. So the, the insect was in there from the very beginning. It grew with the fruit, and then when it got to the, the larva stage as a worm and it crawled out the end, that's why you're seeing the holes to go out. So treating your plants with the proper pesticide with the time is right. So hang the indicator trap, you see the moths are there, they're breeding, then it's time to kill the moths. So you want to use something, because it's a fruit tree that we're going to be eating, you want to use something organic. Captain Jack's is great. It's an organic product that's really good for killing worms and things with rasping mouth parts. So yeah, Captain Jack's in the spring when the moths are breeding. What is the tree doing in this chill time? When they're having the cold time? Okay, so when a tree goes dormant in the winter, when the temperatures are cooler, it basically is a resting phase. It still has sap, it's still alive, but the, slap, the sap is moving slower. So instead of taking it up really fast, it would be like a bear going into hibernation. It's basically just resting. It's got enough nutrients in it. If you keep the soil moist, the sap will still carry things up, up to the top to keep it hydrated, but there are no leaves to produce sugar at the ends, so it's not in a growth phase and it'll just store what it has until the temperatures are right. When the temperatures are right, the buds start to break and the leaves start to form. When the leaves start to form, sugars are then again starting to process, and the sugars are circulated through the tree through the sap, and that's what triggers your new growth. So, so that's what the people are doing with maple syrup. They're tapping into the sap and they're removing that tree's stores. Before it Before it produces its leaves. Yeah. Right. That's and some trees have more sugars in them than others, but that's why if you notice a tree that has sap coming out and there's lots of wasps or bees on it, it's because they're getting the sugar out of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. You had one more question. Yeah, I was just curious. What if you uh, ate one of those? <laughs> it's just more protein. I okay. doubt it's going to make you sick. They're not toxic. They're just gross. <laughs> uh, we used to make, my grandmother used to make mutmo applesauce, and that's because that's what we call our dog. And our dog would jump up and pick the apples out of the tree, and then we'd have all these apples on the ground that had doggy bite marks on them. And some of them would have bugs in it, but those were all our mutmo apples. And so when you have an apple full of worms, just turn it into mutmo applesauce and make something out of it. Did you have a question? 
I think we've covered a lot of bases other than just screening. It's kind of one of those topics, you see what you like, you know what you wanna do, and you ask for help. We've got lots of different varieties of plants that'll work, whether you like lush and evergreen or you like low water, more deserty. If you wanna get the depth of color and you wanna have a little bit of interest and contrast, you can mix it up with similar plants, similar plant needs, but different colors, or you can mix it up with color and texture. It's really up to what you like, but we wanna create a space that fits us. And since I've covered all of our questions, I appreciate everybody coming out. Don't forget to feed, don't forget to check your water, and most of all, don't forget to enjoy your yard. It's the best therapy you'll ever have. Thank you.